My talk is going to be on the need for a new type of agriculture in the West. Uh, a little overview about my foundation, Flux Farm. The basic premise of the organization is to match research-based information on renewable energy and carbon sequestration with uh, the agricultural community in, in Western Colorado and the Intermountain West uh, as, as a value-added opportunity. We, we really th we're really thinking on how to promote the, the long-term economic viability of the region to enhance environmental prosperity, economic prosperity, and social prosperity. So we're thinking, well, let's start to invigorate the region's traditional agrarian sector to adopt some new innovative technologies to help diversify income. So when I talk about the Intermountain West, I, I mean this region, this red block here that's west of the Rockies. It's roughly 130 million acres of private agricultural land in that region. It's predominantly cattle and forage production that's, that's going on there. So the lay of the land. You know, unfortunately, in the last 20 years or so, about 10% of this agricultural resource has been brought out of production. So that means we're losing about 3,000 acres per day in agriculture in the West, which is a lot. It's astounding. Uh, various reasons for that. Some of it is depleted soils. There's limited rainfall. There's seasonality for some of these crops. It's far to commodity markets. Uh, so it's challenging. It's a challenging place to try to make a living growing anything. Uh, and it's largely moving away from agricultural production in the West. So we really forced as rural communities to start to adapt, start to diversify our incomes if we really want to you know, remain viable. Uh, so we're looking at what types of opportunities might exist for these communities. So in western Colorado more generally, we're talking about 7 million acres or so of, of land that's in farms. In Garfield County, just over 3 and a quarter million acres. So we're looking predominantly in this, in, this, uh, in this exercise at some of the marginal acreage. So we're not taking out some of the prime productive lands uh, to do some alternatives on, but some of the marginal lands. So we're limited to about four and a quarter million acres in western Colorado, and these counties down here in, in the, the gray. Uh, for agricultural production, as far as revenue is concerned, the average farm revenue in western Colorado is just under $16,000 a year. In Garfield County, that's even a bleaker picture. They're actually running negative, negative $6,300 a year. So obviously there, there are some other revenue streams that are going on uh, in, in Garfield County. Farmers have multiple jobs. They're working uh, off the farm to make the farm work. So it's clear that some alternatives are needed. If we look at some of the commodity markets, so I just picked out two, and I think this is a really interesting exercise. So if you look at since 2000, the commodity price of beef, which is predominantly what we're producing in the Air Mountain West, has increased in price about 110%, so it's more than doubled. However, the commodity price for our oil has increased 400%, so fourfold increase in 10 years. Since fuel is one of the largest inputs in agriculture, this really affects the bottom line for agricultural producers. So some future opportunities for the West. What, what can we start to do? Is it, is, is the, does the future lie in cattle and forage production and grain production, perhaps mineral leasing for oil and gas development, uh, land conservation? How do, what is the nexus between all of these different things? And it's, it's our belief that we should really start to look at some of these emerging alternatives. So we thought, well, you know, regardless of what technology really wins out for renewable energy production, it's all space dependent. It requires a platform to be placed on. We've got 130 million acres of space, four and a quarter million acres in western Colorado alone. So we think that a natural nexus exists there to start putting some of these renewable energy technologies on these ranches to diversify income. If you look at the investments in renewable energy in the past, uh, since 1995, it was about $5 billion a year. Now, you know, it's up to about $70 billion a year. So this is more than, it's almost doubling every year. It's a growth industry something we should really start to consider. So the bioenergy opportunity. It's very clear that we need to decrease our reliance on foreign oil. Uh, there are some resource issues with access to resources in politically unstable places. Uh, occasional oil spills are, are certainly an issue. When they do happen, it's a big issue. When you compare that to potentially growing a field of bioenergy crops, it's very clear that well, I would, I would certainly prefer the risk involved in 
potentially growing some grasses for fuel production as opposed to some of the catastrophic events that can happen with natural resource extraction. Um, there's some opportunities for domestic economic development and keeping dollars locally. If we can just think about what multiplier effect there would be if we were to able, able to produce some of these fuels and electricity in western Colorado alone, it, it could be very substantial. There's the environmental security issues as well with global warming. Because of all of these different issues, uh, in 2007, the US Energy, and Independence, U.S. Energy Independence and Security Act was enacted, and it mandated the production of 36 billion gallons of fuel, uh, biofuels per year in the United States. So when we talk about bioenergy, this is largely what we mean. It's essentially a solar-powered system in which the solar power grows biomass. And the biomass can mean various things. It can be oil crops, it can be sugar crops, it can be manures, it can be municipal solid wastes, or cellulose crops. We're going to focus on cellulose crops today since we're limited for time, and that's, that's largely what we're doing. So the, the general overview is you take the cellulose crops like a grass or a tree, and you convert them with these different processing technologies. There's a thermochemical using heat and pressure, a biochemical using p pressure and microorganisms to convert these these celluloses into different, into different things, or direct combustion. So with each one of these different technology platforms, you can convert and make different things. So thermochemical is the most diverse. You can make everything from diesels to alcohols to value-added chemical materials and also electricity and heat. So these have different opportunities and limitations and different scales and, and, and different costs associated with them. But generally, that's, that's the overview of what we're thinking. So with conventional biofuels, largely the policy and the action has targeted the Midwest and the Southeast. So we're producing almost 10 billion gallons a year in biofuels, which requires just under 4% of the arable land resource, and it displaces about 4% of our domestic gasoline use. So if you look at that on an acre-for-acre -acre basis, it would require 100% of our arable land to offset 100% of our, of our energy consumption, roughly. And you know, that's purely not acceptable since we need other, other commodities off of that arable land. So these big facilities, they're largely taking feedstock as in corn. Corn ethanol is predominantly what's being produced from a 50 mile square radius around these giant facilities. Uh, just, just to provide a little bit of an overview on what this actually means and why corn ethanol is not the solution and it's you know, a moot point. It takes about 22 pounds of corn to produce one gallon of ethanol. Okay? To produce those 22 pounds of corn requires, just in the production of the corn, almost a half a gallon of diesel fuel. So right there you're burning you know, roughly half of your energy output. Uh, corn production also is, is an unsustainable practice for fuel production because it's incredibly resource intensive. You're managing that crop, it's an annual crop, you're having to plant it every year, you're having to apply herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, a lot of water. It's, it's a lot of energy goes into producing these things. It, doesn't, it just doesn't work. Uh, and to give you, give you a little idea on what these plants really look like, we're talking they're upwards of 280 million gallons per year production. This is huge. This is a huge thing. To, to feed this plant, you're talking just under 17 million pounds of corn a day. 17 million pounds of corn requiring about 1,600 acres a day to produce that corn. So these are massive, massive plants. However, change is really coming. The mandate for that 36 billion gallons per year, it's cut off at 12 billion gallons per year for corn ethanol production. So we've almost reached that limit already. You know, beyond that, we're looking at cellulosic crops and, and, and implementation potentially of a low carbon fuel standard to move away from some of these more industrially produced agricultural crops for biofuels production. So it's a mandate. We, can't, we, we can no longer do this. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense uh, on an energy footprint, uh, but we're also, you're not going to get any incentives from the federal government if you install a corn ethanol plant in the future. So the need for biomass. The Department of Energy and the USDA says biomass, biomass is the only foreseeable opportunity to sustainably offset the liquid transportation fuel in the United States. That's the statement that they made. So we need a lot of biomass. They said that we can sustainably produce about 1.3 billion tons per year, which is a lot. It's enough to offset about 30% of our domestic fuel consumption by 2030. 
So still, producing 1.3 billion tons of biomass, which is a lot of biomass, it's only going to get us to about a third of our fuel consumption domestically. So a lot of people talk about algae. And while I think algae is a great technology, it's emerging, I just have to throw this in there, it's really of no value to agricultural producers because it's not farming. It's chemical engineering. While some of these things might be placed on farms, it's more likely that they'll be produced placed on chemical engineering facilities and, and farmers won't get that value. So it's, while it might be an incremental way of, of helping produce the energy that we need, because we need a lot of energy, it's very, very low value for agricultural producers. So what, what does a bioenergy economy look like for the West? We got to thinking about this. Well, it's, it's relatively unknown. We're, we're very much pioneering a lot of these questions. Not a lot has been done there. It's a difficult region to grow things in. So we got to thinking, <clears throat> well, we need to give this some thought. So in, in 2007, Flux Farm Foundation was formed to start asking some of these questions. And we were just a little tiny research firm and asking all these things. And, and the city of Rifle, uh, not connected to us in 2007, also got a grant from the USDA to look at biomass feasibility in the region, in western Colorado and Garfield County in particular. And, and they hired some really nice consultants and, and got some data. Uh, and they figured, well, yeah, bioenergy is, is a viable opportunity for the region. So they found this in 2007. And then in 2008, they got to talking, the city of Rifle got to talking with Colorado Mountain College. So they have a process technology program here. You know, let's, let's maybe think about making some, some fuel here out of some things that might be grown here. So they got to talking and they called, they called, uh, they called Colorado State University, they called Calvin Pearson and a few other, few other people and they said, well, you know, what opportunities might exist to sustainably produce enough feedstock to maybe get this plant going so we can provide a working model. And we all got together and in 2000, 2009 we formed the, the Western Colorado Carbon Neutral Bioenergy Consortium. So it's, a, it's an organization that we've teamed up together to start, to start asking some of these questions and, and pr pursuing some targeted research. So in, in 2010, we, we got some, our first grant as, as the consortium to do some actual research, some trial research with growing biomass crops here in the region. So we got a grant from the Colorado Department of Agriculture, their acre program, to conduct research at three different locations in western Colorado to start to get a good idea on what can be grown where at what cost so we can start feeding this processing plant that we're also simultaneously building. So what does the proposed scenario really look like? Uh, largely, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about producing low input, high, high biomass perennial grasses. So we're talking about things like crested wheatgrass and different types of bromes, even throwing in some switchgrass there. But predominantly, we're looking at cool season adapted grasses for production in the region. More of that will be covered in Calvin's talk, and he'll be able to wow you with all the things that we're doing there. We're also looking at it's more of the, the, the western and southwestern regions actually producing cacti. For, for production into biomass. Cacti are incredibly prolific uh, and they have a lot of nice sugars that are, that are in these cacti uh, to produce some, some interesting biofuels with and they can be grown on very, very marginal lands. So this is also something that we're looking into and we've established a growth trial in, in Fruta to start looking at cacti production. So as far as processing is concerned, we're certainly not taking the model of the 280 million gallon per year processing facility. That certainly won't work here in the West. We are looking at distributed processing units that, that make sense, that match with the feedstock availability in that particular region. So we're starting to think like a ruminant animal. These animals like cows that have, have been adapted to, to the prairie uh, that, that are opportunistic, they actually go to the site of the feedstock when it's available and eat it. They process it there and then they move on when it's gone. I think that's a really interesting model to start to look at, start to think about for biofuels processing. As far as the consumption, we're making butanol. Butanol is an alcohol. It's much like ethanol, but it has superior qualities over ethanol. It's more energy dense than ethanol, and it can also be used in the existing cars and trucks that we have today, uh, in our gasoline vehicles and also our diesel vehicles. It can be used in a diesel vehicle. Uh, it can be used unblended in an unleaded gasoline vehicle. So it's a very, very exciting technology, and, and, and we're, we're doing it.